All right, uh, any questions before we get started? Turn to Psalms 127. I want to explain something. Because this is a topical type of a lesson, uh, there's no way I can stay in one place. But I did want to start out in Psalms 127. The first thing I wanted to mention, if you want to have godly children, you want to rear godly children, what is the first thing that needs to happen? And I think there's an order, and we have to understand the importance of certain uh, people in our lives. The first one is this, the importance of the Lord and the Word of God when it comes to rearing godly children. I follow my outline, folks. Um, and Psalms 127, it says this, Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Unless the Lord's helping us build our home, we're working for nothing. That word vain means empty. It means futile. It means worthless or useless. And uh, the Lord has to help us build our home. I put down Colossians 1.18, and it says this, talking about our Lord. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he must have the preeminence. We want to rear godly children. We want to rear godly grandchildren. The Lord has to come first, and for so many different reasons. I learned a long time ago, I have a hard time pleasing a bunch of people. Uh, in fact, I found it impossible after a year working with my young hearts. I was ready to quit. I went to Doc Thompson and said, I can't do this. He said, what's the problem? He said, I can't please him. He says, don't. He said, please him. And that's what you have to do when you're rearing a family. Uh, uh, when you're dealing with your children, you're going to have to decide. Who are you going to put first place? And if it isn't the Lord, then it's going to be the children. And if it's the children, you're going to be doing what they want you to do and not what he wants you to do. And so uh, we must build our homes upon the word of God and the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ. Another familiar verse. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a what? Rock. And that rock is Jesus Christ. But I want you to see something here. Listen to what the beginning of it says. Therefore, whosoever heareth my sayings, but does it stop there? No, what's the next three words? And doeth them. It is not enough to hear the word of God. It is not enough to say you love the Lord. It is not enough to say that you're putting him first. It, you have to do. Uh, and, and then you look at the other part of it, which we're not going to uh, go to, 25, 26, when it talks about the foolish man. And it says he hears the word of God, but he doesn't do it. So it doesn't make, unless this book is your rule book, instruction manual for rearing your children, for having a godly home, there's no hope. You're, you can send them to the finest schools, you can buy them the finest clothes, and they're going to grow up and break your heart. If the Lord is not helping you rear that home, uh, rear, uh, train those children. Then number C, and by the way, you have a question, pop it up and uh, we'll do our best to answer. Unless the Lord is helping us build our home, our labor is vain. Vain means worthless, empty, and useless. Uh, number D, when the Lord is helping us build our homes, we can sleep peacefully at night. Let me see the context of this. It's talking about in their days when they had a watchman watching the city. And it's saying, unless the Lord's helping Israel, unless the Lord's helping them with their homes, uh, um, uh, their, their watchman is in vain. And it says, uh, the next verse, it says, um, except, the, uh, uh, except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. But listen to what the next one sa verse says. It is vain, empty, useless, futile to rise up early and to sit up late. Um, if the Lord's not helping you build your home. If your children are, when they hit those teenage years, and, and it's tough, and, and you're going to lose a lot of sleep, and you're going to be up in the middle of the night wondering where they're at, wondering what they're doing. Well, if the Lord helps you build your home, what does it say? It says, uh, uh, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. And, and uh, that's what we have to understand. Now, 
Uh, let's look at the next verse. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are an inheritance or an inheritance of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. God gives us children to be a blessing as an inheritance. But you know, I hear, and I had this in my family because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I grew up in a dysfunctional home. I heard things like, I hate you. I wish you were dead. Talking to the children. Parents talking to the children. And I was the child. Folks, those words should never, ever, ever even come into your mind. God didn't give us children to hate and to wish they were dead. God gave us children because he loved us for an inheritance and to replenish the earth. That's another reason he gave us children. Um, now watch this. It says, um, uh, our children are like, number F, uh, our inheritance as a reward and a blessing, not a curse. But our children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. Look at verse 4. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. God likens our children to arrows. And in that day there, in the Old Testament time there, the armies with the greatest archers won all the battles. Unless God intervened, and he intervened several times. But the greatest victories, the greatest battles were won were the armies with the archers because they knew how to use that bow. They knew how to use the sling. And they could kill their enemy before they even got close to them. And God says, our children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. I liken an arrow in their age as to atomic bomb in our age. That's how powerful a weapon uh, the arrows were back then. They didn't have the bombs and all these other things that we have today. But our children are like arrows. Now, here's my question. Well, not a question, but an arrow that's not sharp is not going to do much. And an arrow is not straight, it's going to miss its target. And God likens our children to arrows. Now let's go on. G, happy is the man uh, that has a house full of them. They shall not be ashamed. Their children shall speak to the enemies in the gate. Happy is the man who hath his quiver full of them. That quiver is what you put your arrows in. Uh, they shall not be ashamed. Now, who shall not be ashamed? I think that's, it could go either way. It could be that the parents won't be ashamed of the children if the Lord's helping them build their home. And the children's not going to be ashamed of the parents if the Lord's helping you build your home. But they shall speak with the enemies in the gates. I read so many commentaries, and I didn't agree with any of them. I asked the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? This is what he shared with me, and you may have disagreed, and that's okay. You can come up with your own thinking. And by the way, this book is an exhaustible book. You could preach 20 messages on John 3, 16, and I have them all be biblical. Because this is such a precious uh, exhaustible book. But uh, it says, they shall speak with the enemy in, in the gates. Can I ask you a question? What does the Bible talk about a gate? When it talks about the church. The gates of what? Shall not prevail against the church. The gates of hell. And it talks about children are arrows. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Who is our enemy? <coughs> Satan? Huh? Satan's our enemy, isn't he? Boy, you guys aren't responding very well. Shake your head and make me feel good. Uh, but, but Satan has unsaved children, too, spiritually speaking. I believe this can, and it can mean 15 other things. Uh, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. They shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Um, our enemies uh, is Satan, uh, the world, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, and, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. If we rear our children correctly... If they're straight arrows, if they're sharp arrows, they will speak with you. I believe it's talking about they can win them to Christ. God can use our children to be fruitful, to, to uh, uh, produce fruit, to win people to Jesus Christ. They can speak to the enemies of the gates. Now, you could probably come up with five other things, but that's what the Lord spoke, uh, spoke to me on that. So, uh, happy is the man that ha uh, has a house full of children. Happy is the man that has this quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemy of the gates. But that's only if the Lord is helping us build our home. And it's only if um, our arrows are sharp and they're straight. And, and, and the way the Lord helps us build our home is through his holy and precious word. So, 
We talked about the importance of um, the Lord uh, working in our life and the Word of God uh, to rearing godly children. But here's the second thing, the importance of a father when it comes to training godly children. The father is very, very important. Satan is destroying our homes, dividing our families. And where does the world does the father play? The father, father's primary role is to be a godly provider and a leader in the home. Uh, and unto Abraham he said, be, uh, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Uh, cursed be the ground for thy sake, and sorrow thou shalt eat all thy days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of the face shalt thou eat bread, till thou turn, uh, return to the ground. Um, for out of it thou wast taken, for thus thou art, and thus thou return. God gave Adam the job of providing for the family. And we don't have time to go to Ephesians where he's supposed to lead the home and everything else. But the father's very, very important in the home. Um, 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 he's to be the primary breadwinner. And I know we live in a society today when women have to work. And we do. My wife's work. Uh, preachers don't make that much money if they're honest. I tell them my name's Beaver, not Baker. I don't have a $5,000 doghouse. And, and so she's worked. But we've worked our schedule to where either our children work with us or she was with them um, uh, when they weren't in school. Um, now, watch this. The heart of the father must be turned to the children, and the hearts of the children turned to the father. In Malachi 4, this was prophecy in verses 5 and 6. Somebody else read. Somebody else mind reading that? I'm getting a little raspy here. Anybody read Mal Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. Go ahead, brother. He shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. Now I want you to see in Luke, the fulfilling of this was through John the Baptist to a great extent. Go ahead and read Luke 117, brother. And he shall go, was referring to John the Baptist. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. That shocked me when I read that. Fathers are very, very important in a home. A father needs to get the hearts of his children as well as the wife. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, here's another thing. The, uh, let's see here. The father and the mother must get their children's heart. How? What's a, one of the best ways to get your children's heart? I believe it's uh, uh, Proverbs 23, 26, what Solomon said to his son. And uh, he said son, but it could be generic. Uh, somebody else want to read? I love this verse. My son. Go ahead, brother. My son, give me thine heart. Solomon was asking for his son's heart. Well, how in the world was he going to get it? By letting thine eyes Observe my ways. One of the greatest ways to get to your kids' hearts, you need to do it at a young age, and you do it by practicing what you preach, by living the right kind of example in front of them. If you don't want them to smoke, son, don't smoke. It's bad for your health. That is not going to do it. I went out visiting, and I do this all the time, and I meet somebody I don't even know. And I just have a funny way of finding out if they're living together or they're married. And when they're living together, you know what I always do? I say, i got a couple verses for rearing your children. Psalms 127.1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. But then I give them Proverbs 23.26. And I see a precious little one there. And I said, my son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes deserve my ways. God says you need to get your child's heart. Why? Because somebody or something will. Dope, liquor. Uh, pornography, bad women, bad men, bad friends, something's going to get their kids' hearts. What do we need to do when they're young? Get our kids' hearts. Get our kids' hearts. And then when they get older, they give their hearts to who? They give it to the Lord. But a little child doesn't know who the Lord is when they're really small. You, and I'm not saying this irreverently, but you're really the God that they know. The leader that they know. So we need to get their hearts. How do you do that? I think the best way to do it is be, the, be what you want them to be. 
If you don't, if you're not, you're a hypocrite. So we need to practice what we preach. We need to get our kids' hearts. A father is important in a home. Here's another one. It didn't say mother. It says father. Provoke not your children to wrath. And I put in anger, but bring them up uh, by nurturing them in the Lord and the word of God. Uh, Ephesians 6.4. Somebody else read that, please. Anybody? Go ahead and read it again, brother. You're doing great. Ephesians 6.4. That word nurture uh, means uh, that which promotes growth, education, and instruction. And when it's talking about the nurture of the Lord, it's talking about in His Word. Uh, it, uh, that means to feed, to nourish, to educate, to bring up, to train up. Admonition means, watch this, gentle, reproof, counsel against a fault, instructions in duty, caution, caution direction. And a father isn't thought to be doing this. A father wants to be a macho guy that uh, uh, doesn't want to show his feelings and emotions. You can't do that when you're rearing children. You need to um, um, nurture them. Um, um, then it says in Colossians 3.21, Fathers, provoke your, not your children to anger, lest they be what? What's that next word? Yes, we can discourage our children by getting angry. Uh, we can uh, provoke them to wrath by not practicing what we preach. Do as I say, not as I do. That dog's not going to tree no coon. You can't operate that when you're rearing your children. And by the way, your children know you better than anybody else. They know you better than the pastor does, probably. They know what you're like. They know your strengths. They know your weaknesses. Let's talk about the mother for a second, the importance of the mother when it comes to training Godly children. The wife, uh, the wife and mother's primary role in the home is to bear the children and to be keeper of the home. Genesis 3.16. Who wants to read that? Any lady? Anybody? Oh, yeah, anybody. Yes, go. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Watch this part of this verse. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. Do you know Biblically speaking, from a, a godly point of view, God put in the heart of every woman, every wife, uh, uh, to, um, uh, and thy desire to, should be to thy husband. Uh, he put that in you. Now, it may not be in you now, and he may not be worth it, but he, had, he does put that desire in you. And um, um, uh, uh, it's... And the rule over there, I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Titus 2, verses 4 and 5. Go ahead, brother. That they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers of home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blessed. See, I haven't said much about the children yet, but yet if you don't have this foundation, you don't have any hope for your children. And keepers at home, it's the primary purpose of a wife to be the keeper at home. Now, I understand you have to work. I understand that completely. And, and, uh, uh, but I was very cautious when we, were grow, uh, when we were young married and even older, after I understood a little bit about the scriptures, uh, even though I didn't make that much, I made sure that our, my, what I brought in was the primary breadwinning of the home. My wife we used for vacations or for things. Um, uh, at first, we used it for everything, buying potatoes and everything we could think of. But, but um, uh, we get these roles reversed times at times, and then you have problems in the home. Um, uh, that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husband or children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. Watch this verse. A wife and mother has the power to build or destroy her home. Go ahead. All I'm trying to get you to see is this. Number one, the Lord has to be first in the home. Number two, the husband and the wife play an important role in rearing the children and having godly children. And then I want to do this. The importance of both parents when it comes to training godly children. Uh, the husband and wife must walk together in agreement, for if their house is divided, it will not stand. I know we use these verses, Amos 3.3. 3. I know I'm taking them a little bit out of context, but the principles are there. Can two 
walk together, except they be agreed. A house divided against itself will not... Let me tell you something. Satan, we have... I wish we, we could pull back the curtains and see the battle that, that's going on between Satan's angels and God's angels. I'd like people to see the big picture. He will do everything to divide that home. The greatest thing you could do in rearing your children is to be in agreement with each other. And if you have some fussing to do, don't let them see it. That will divide your home. Children will follow the path of the least resistance. And by the way, that's what Satan does. He always follows the path of the least resistance. And he will get the children at odds, uh, get the parents at odds with each other. The children will do that if you let them. Uh, um, uh, what, uh, uh, you ask, the child asks the mother, what to do, uh, can they do this? They said, no. And so they'll go ask the father. You know what the father ought to say? What did your mom say? Because they're trying to get to do what they want to do, and they'll go to the, uh, um, uh, to, to the one person that are a little more lenient than the others. Now, um, the husband and wife must be uh, filled with the Spirit, submitting themselves to each other. Watch this in the what? Fear of God. Fear is a motivator, folks. I taught that on that Wednesday night. A godly fear is a healthy fear. Whoever you fear is who you're going to obey. You know why people do what their children tell them? They're afraid. They're afraid of losing like, their love. Uh, uh, why do they let their uh, not-so-good friends be friends with them? Why do they do that? Because they're afraid. You need to fear him more than you fear them. With a godly fear. Uh, because fear uh, is a motivator in everything we do. Now, uh, where, uh, and be not drunk with wine, where is access? Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to your psalms and uh, to your uh, selves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Give thanks always for all the things of God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch this. Submitting yourselves one to another. Now there's an order in submitting, and we'll talk about it in a second. But you need to submit yourselves to each other. You need to be in agreement with each other. You need to listen to each other. Now, the father is responsible for making that final uh, um, uh, decision if you can't agree, uh, as long as it's biblical. By the way, let me say this in submitting. God always gives us a way out. When it comes to um, uh, ladies submitting to their husbands, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. What's that next part of that verse? As unto the... Yeah, so if that husband's telling you to do something contrary to the word of God, you don't do it. How about children? Obey your parents in the what? Yeah, you tell them to go buy, buy you a pack of cigarettes, go down there and get you something to drink. They don't have to do that. So, so this submission business um, uh, isn't as bad as we, we make it out to be. Now, here, here, go, here goes. Um, and this is the uh, only reason I put it in this order is because that's the order it is in Ephesians, Ephesians 5, through 24. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands and as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let your wives to be, uh, be to their own husbands in everything. Oh, I can't submit. I went over a couple's house. She called me up, young Christians. I can't submit to him. I just can't do it. I says, don't. I don't have to. No, nope. submit to him. Look, the way I, look, look, the, look at the way I worded it. The wife must submit herself to the who? The Lord by submitting herself to their husband. That's what you're doing. Uh, um, now, let's talk about the husband. The husband is to love their wives as Christ loved the church and as they love their own bodies. Uh, that's how we're supposed to love our wives. And I believe that with all my heart, if a husband will love his wife like he loves his own body, uh, like Christ loved the church, he's not going to have any problem with his wife submitting, and vice versa. You have a wife that will submit to her husband as long as she's not telling her to do anything. My philosophy is this on submission. By the way, I submit a lot. I'm a second man. I'm a lot like a wife is to a husband when it comes to being a, an assistant pastor. Um, uh, I, I submit. And here's my principle on submitting. If somebody asks me to do something like that's an authority over me that isn't contrary to this book, I try to do it. And that's the way, kind of attitude. We, if Jesus Christ 
could submit himself to his unsaved parents until he was 30. The sinless son of God submit himself to his unsaved, sinful parents. Well, I should say uh, Joseph and his mother. Uh, why, why do we have so much problem? That's how so, and by the way, let me say this about submitting. You mark this down. This is what I taught my children. This one verse I taught my children uh, was, uh, and you know it, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow it, that shall you also. Yeah. You don't submit, you mark it down. When your kids get older, they're not going to submit either. Why? Because you reap what you sow. And let me say this, because we live in a women's lib society today. You have to understand something. God, when he, he, he made his word and formed the word of God, he only had two roles in the Bible uh, of people to play. Number one was male, the other was female. And when you get to heaven, it isn't going to be husband and wife anymore. The scriptures say you shall be as angels, not angels, but have glorified but as angels. You, you ladies that submit and do, did what you were supposed to do the best you could with your husband, you could have a higher position with the Lord in heaven. God is not a respecter of persons. And, and so um, um, uh, submitting, that is all. Uh, uh, and you say, what does it have to do with children? It has everything to do with children. If They will divide you and they will watch you. And if you won't submit, why should they submit? Um, let's go on. Let's see here. Uh, love, uh, husband love their wives as, as uh, 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 Christ loved the church and loved their bodies. And he really goes into detail here. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the uh, church and gave himself for it, that he may sanctify and cleanse it. Uh, then it go down to so ought men ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man yet ever yet hated one his flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord, uh, Lord the church. For we are members of the body, of the flesh, and of his bones. Just as you love your body, and just as you take care of your body, you need to take care of your wife, men. And, and the kids need to see that. Husbands and wives should be one flesh if they're going to rear godly children. For this cause shall uh, a man leave his father and his mother and be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Uh, this is a great mystery, but I, uh, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. You're one flesh. The wife is the completer to the husband. The husband is not complete without the wife. She's the completer. So let's talk about principles on rearing godly, godly children. Number uh, one. Uh, by the way, how much time do we have? Is it 10 after, I think? Is it 10 after? What time do you have to get your kids? Uh, that lets me know. Five after, ten after? Help me. Ten after? Okay. All right. Um, principles uh, in training godly children. Number one, A, to train godly children, we must start training as a child. Uh, uh, the rod of reproof giveth wisdom. But listen to what this verse says. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to what? You don't train that child. You just leave him alone. And they're going to break your heart. They're going to bring shame upon your family. Uh, train up a child in a way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Uh, it says child. It doesn't say teenager. You've got to start at a young age. They say within the first five years, a child's character is basically set to a great degree. Uh, and so it's important to train up a child. You must train a child physically, mentally, and spiritually, setting the right kind of example for them to follow, and bring them up in a nurture and admonition of the Lord. Training them physically and mentally is usually easier because we have, other, uh, we have others helping us, such as schools, and we take them to you know, different places, to uh, baseball, whatever. You, know. you have people helping you with those two areas. But I'll tell you where the hardest training comes from is when it's spiritually speaking, especially a father setting the example. Especially the father leading the home. Uh, train uh, them spiritually, but uh, let's see here. Takes more time, effort, and is not as comfortable, uh, and you're, we're not as comfortable as doing it. Train them spiritually by having a personal, uh, personal and family discipline. You say, why do you have a personal devotion? I have to have a personal devotion if I'm going to set the right kind of example for them to follow. And you try to help them to have a personal devotion. And it isn't much when you first start out. And then a family devotion that are short and sweet, not long and boring. Uh, um, uh, it's, Christianity shouldn't be boring. And uh, uh, um, we had a little book, Little Visits with God. 
Uh, it was a, a, a book that we read to our kids when they were very, very young. Um, I don't even know if it's in print anymore. Uh, train them spiritually by teaching them to be faithful to all the church services. Train them spiritually by challenging them to read through the Bible when they are old enough. I really believe with all my heart this book is life-changing. I've read through it. The thing that changed Jack Beaver's life more than anything else when I first became a Christian was Doc Thompson saying this. You read everything I, if you uh, um, uh, listen to everything I tell you from this pulpit and don't get into this book to see that it's true, you're a fool because I could be telling you anything. That opened my eyes. I said, I can't live on this guy's standards and convictions. I have to develop my own. And uh, uh, I've read through the the Word of God, every year I've been a Christian. Every ministry I have, I've challenged them to do that. I challenge our kids as soon as they were old enough. I have, a, I have a, a Bible reading schedule, get you through the New Testament twice. If you're a young Christian, New Testament twice. Uh, and Psalms and Proverbs twice in a year. Um, and, and then I had, I had the one, I, the one that's developed the one that we use for the church. They just redo it over and over every year. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, the Word of God is so important if you're going to train them spiritually. To train a, ch- a godly child, we must dwell with them according to knowledge. Now, that's a scripture that we use for the husbands to the wives. It says to honor them and dwell with them according to knowledge. You've got to do that with your children. Every child isn't the same. Every child doesn't grasp things the same. Every child isn't as sharp as, another, uh, as the other child. You have to understand that. And if a child is, is capable of getting A's and B's, then it's good to challenge him to do that. But if a child can only get uh, uh, C's, then you've got to understand that too. So uh, um, uh, challenge them. Um, uh, dwell with them according to knowledge. Know your children. Nobody should know your children better than you do. And uh, their strengths, their weaknesses. Um, so let's go on. To train children, we must chasten them properly. You must chasten your children in love using, here's what I, the Lord just taught me this just recently. How do you chase them in love? I believe you use the fruit of the spirits, fruit of the spirit, uh, and, and start when they are young. He that spareth the rod, and by the way, when I teach on these verses in my Bible doctor's class, I use these verses, not that I'm teaching on children, but I'm teaching you cannot always interpret the Bible. When you're studying the Bible, the best way to study the Bible is interpreting it literally. It means exactly what it says. Always interpret the Bible literally, but there are times you can't. There's a scripture that says, Jesus says, I am the door. Is Jesus the door? Of course not. Uh, there's another scripture that says, uh, uh, except you eat his flesh and drink my blood. Uh, 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 does God want us to be cannibals? Of course not. So you always interpret literally, but when you interpret literally, it doesn't make sense. And this verse here is one you cannot interpret literally. He that spareth the rod, rod, does God want us to be child abusers? Yes or no? The Bible says, before you offend one of my little children, you'd be better off taking a millstone and putting it around your neck and, and jumping into the sea. You'd better off committing suicide before you offend one of my little children. You take a baseball bat upside your kid. Do you think the kid will get offended? I think so. So it's not talking about a rod, and I don't have time to go into that. But what I want you to see is this. But if you don't chasten your children, the Bible says what? You hateth them. But it says, uh, he that loveth him chasteneth him B times. That B times is an old English word that means early or before it's too late. Here's another one. Hebrews, God likens the, our relationship with him. He's our heavenly father. We're his children as to the relationship between parents and their children. Hebrews chapter 5 talks about the chastening of the Lord. And it says, um, um, Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, not hateth, loveth. He chasteth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. How do you you chasten your children with love? It takes time. It takes patience. Uh, And by the way, you should never chasten your children until you've taught them first. And we don't chasten children biblically, and I'll get to that in just a second. But here's a good way to, to, to work love in it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So you want to chasten your children love. Try to use the fruit of the Spirit. You want to keep from provoking your children to wrath. You want to keep from getting your children mad at you. Let them see the fruit of the Spirit in your life. 
It's not easy. Not for me anyway. Um, you should chasten your children in love. Here's a biblical reason to chasten your children. To drive out the foolishness in their heart. Or foolishness is rebellion against God. Watch this. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So biblically speaking, we chasten our children to drive out the foolishness in them. What is the foolishness? Well, a fool has said in their heart, there is no God. Now we think of that as being an atheist. Folks, Christians are fools. When you say no to God, you're a fool. And we need to, you chasten them, you chasten your children to drive out the foolishness when they are disobedient to this book. You know why we chasten our children? Because they inconvenienced us. Oh, we're late. Or they got you angry. That's not biblical reasons for chastening your children. Uh, you don't chasten your children um, um, because uh, they got you angry. Um, you should chasten your children for, uh, uh, we should not chasten our children for our pleasure or for our profit, but for their profit to make them holy like uh, the Lord is. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. Talking about the fathers, uh, the parents, the fathers, chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, talking about the Lord, for our uh, profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. God doesn't chasten us for his profit. He doesn't chasten us um, because uh, um, 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 uh, we got him mad. He chastens us because he wants us to be holy like he is holy. Now, not because they inconvenienced you, not because they embarrassed you. You ever do that? Your kids embarrass you, you we wail on them. That's not a biblical reason for chastening your children. Um, because it got you mad. Uh, you're not supposed to do it for your profit. You chasten the children for their profit to drive the foolishness out of them. To train godly children. Here's a, here's a thing that I think will work. I think is great in a, substi uh, uh, in a substitute of uh, chastening. Try uh, to train godly children. Try using praise to remove impurities. As a finding pot for silver and a furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. Now, a finding pot is used to heat up the silver, and, and it, it removes the dross from the silver so you can have pure silver. Same thing with a furnace for gold. It heats up the gold, and, and it removes the pure impurities, and you have pure gold. Well, it says, as a finding pot refines the silver, gets the impurities out of it, and a furnace gets the impurities uh, out of the gold, so is a man to his praise. We often... Johnny comes home um, um, uh, and gets a C on his report card, and you want him to get an A, and you rail him for it, uh, uh, or, or whatever. Uh, uh, um, uh, try using prayer. He got a messed up room, and he, cleans a, he, try, he makes a halfway decent effort to clean. Praise him for it. You'd be surprised, as a little child especially, how that will remove the impurities out of them. Uh, it'll, uh, let me say something. Does your kids ever say this to you? Um, I can never do anything to please you. There's a red flag when they say that. I can never do any teenagers especially. I can never do anything to please you. What are they telling you? You probably don't praise them very much. You're probably so negative and critical that, that they don't see, they can't do anything to please you. So try to find ways to praise them. Honest praise, not lies, but honest praise. Um, let's see, to train godly children, uh, try to use praise to train godly children, set, setting goals and, reward, and rewarding them uh, when they achieve the goals. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. When you have a desire, a hope, and it doesn't come to pass, your heart's sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Well, we have, I live on goals. I live with goals. I taught my kids, I try to give my kids goals uh, to achieve something. Uh, and then rewarded them when they achieved the goals. Uh, I, I think that's a great way of, of uh, training children. Um, uh, set goals for them. It says this. Um, um, uh, there's another verse. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but the desire cometh as a tree of life. It gives them a reason to live. Uh, the desire accomplished is sweet to the soul. When you have a goal and it's accomplished, I pass out uh, uh, 365 tracks a year. Uh, I read through the Bible in a year. I have all kind of goals that I set personally. 
Uh, and I taught my children to set goals. Uh, getting good grades, uh, you can reward them for getting good grades. Um, reading through the Bible. Breaking a bad habit. Try rewarding them. Uh, bedwetter, you know, and, 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 uh, and encourage them. And they, they, they've been doing it every day. Well, they went a week without the pray. Oh, Johnny, that was wonderful. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that'll help. Uh, here's this. To train your godly, uh, godly children, to train godly children, be a good listener. Wherefore, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. We got two ears and one mouth because we need to listen twice as much as we talk. Um, to train godly children, we need to, this is important right here. To train godly children, you need to admit when you've made a mistake. You're going to make a mistake. And they know it. What do you do? Greatest mess, one of the greatest messages I've, I've ever heard was simply these points. Um, point number one, I'm sorry. Point number two, I was wrong. Point number three, you were right. Point number four, will you forgive me? You need to do, man, you need to do that with your kids. You're going to mess up. You need to do it with your wife. We will mess up. Uh, when you're, uh, here's the last thing. And when you have something hard to say or do when training a child, just remember, charity never faileth. I don't know what Brother Hoffman did. He may have had you ask bunches and bunches of questions. I don't know. I'll stay here till 9 o'clock if you want to ask questions. Uh, I'll be teaching on uh, teens in two weeks. And I will be using some personal illustrations. This is sort of my foundation. This has been a foundation even for children. And I realize some people don't get saved until their kids are teenagers. It's very hard to rear godly children in heaven. Y your hope is that the Lord gets a hold of their heart. If you can't get their heart, that the Lord gets a hold of their heart. Um, I'm going to pray, and then anybody wants to ask any questions, I don't want to keep everybody here. You've got to go get your kids. Father, thank you. It's hot in here, Lord. Uh, I pray that you'll bless and uh, uh, Lord, help us to apply, uh, apply Bible principles to our lives when it comes to rearing our children. Help, help us to rear, uh, rear them with love, with the fruit of the Spirit. Help us to be walking together with each other. Help us to be in agreement. Uh, Lord, help uh, Satan not to divide our homes by getting us fussing with each other, uh, especially when it comes to rearing the children. They pick up on that pretty quick. Bless these couples. Their children are the future of our church. And, Lord, uh, uh, we need uh, uh, godly ch children that we can uh, um, uh, rear uh, in the nurture and admonition of your word. We ask you to bless us, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen.